As a liberal arts major with parents who wanted, dreamed of me becoming an engineer, um, I'm here be, to support the storytellers out there. And as I was watching the video, um, you know, one of the women said, you know, you have nothing, we leave nothing but our children behind and the stories that we tell them really. And recently I did a story about the secret to happy families. There was a book that came out and the author told me that one factoid that I found fascinating and relevant for tonight, which is that the number one sort of um, indicator of resilience among our children is whether or not they know their family history, which is fascinating if you think about it. And, and clearly tonight is all about family history, oral history. And the reason for that is because families have different narrative arcs. You have an ascending narrative, like we came to the States, we're gonna conquer, we're gonna like grow, grow, grow. Or a descending narrative where like, oh, it all went to hell. <laughs> or you have an oscillating family history where somebody lost his job, but then they did better, and somebody got cancer, but somebody, and, and that is life. And to teach that to our children through storytelling is really important, and the idea that they can identify with their family history um, can help make them resilient in their lives. So on that note, I want to introduce our next speaker, uh, talk about resilience. His name is Milton Washington. And if you ask Milton's adopted mother, Gwendolyn, why she and her husband, Don, decided to adopt Milton, she'll be quick to tell you, we didn't adopt Milton, he adopted us. And even to this day, Milton will tell you that he finds that story so amusing that he kind of decided to write a memoir around it. The book is entitled Slicky Boy, and it's expected to debut, he was telling me, maybe next year, maybe. I've actually never had somebody stare me in the eyes and say, my mother was a prostitute. <laughs> and that's sort of where it begins. It's about a black boy born to a Korean prostitute in South Korea who roams his camp town with a pack of homeless kids. Like something out of a Dickens novel, there's plenty of adventures of Milton among the street urchins, stealing, fighting, and drinking alcohol at about the age of six or so while his mother was working. But one day during a temporary stay at an orphanage, I think he said, what, eight, ten days, something like that? The eight-year-old Miltuna, Miltuna steals his way into the hearts and into the lives of the Washingtons, a black army family from Texas. It is, as you can see, an incredibly compelling story about isolation, about identity. But most of all, it's a story of the love of not one but two mothers that insulates the boy for the rest of his wonderful life. Tonight's tale is about the chance nature of those moments when our lives intersect in profound ways. Just how did Miltona steal away into the lives of the Washingtons? They went by the orphanage to adopt another black boy, but instead, as Mrs. Washington says, Milton adopted them. Ladies and gentlemen, Milton Washington. Oh, wow. First of all, thank you uh, for having me, H.J., Great American Story, Eugenia Kim. That was awesome. I'm going to have problems sleeping tonight. Thanks. <laughs> but yeah, um, you know, it, one of the, I remember my mother, Milton, come over da. Yeah, see? That works in a Korean crowd. That works. That means come eat. That's what mothers say to their kids, to come eat. Well, listen, um, so I wanted to tell this story about me, but I wanted to tell the story about me through Joseph, who is now my brother. No, it's, it's fine. And yeah, I was drinking at six, so I'm bringing this with me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, and, and one of the things that I think you need to know before I tell the story is um, Joseph, uh, he was 10 when, I, when he was adopted, and I was 8, and we were adopted at the same time from St. Vincent's Orphanage for Amerasians, ran by Father King, um, who was from Marino, New York, uh, by way of Boston. And, um, and the reason that I want to tell you my story through Joseph's story uh, is because I think there is an interesting um, intersection of lives 
But I also think that um, his story is much like mine. And, um, but I think it's, it's a bit more interesting, to be honest. So, um, so uh, uh, back in 2009, when I had just started uh, writing this book, um, and the name of the book is called Slicky Boy, uh, because that's what they used to call us in the camp town. Um, it's, <laughs> um, you know, we used to steal, and uh, wow, it's like the, the memories that I have, and and the, and the, I guess the catharsis that I'm going through writing this book is is pretty amazing. But um, but Joseph was uh, much like me. Him uh, ten when he was adopted, and I was eight. But we had met in the orphanage for, um, uh, we had known each other for eight days because my mother dropped me off at that orphanage uh, for just several days. Um, and, but she had dropped me off at orphanages before because, um, because yeah, she was a prostitute. Uh, and, and I say that because I saw it. Um, and, you know, but that's not a value judgment, so don't judge. Uh, she was a mother. She was a great mother to me, and I think she's uh, a lot of the reason I am kind of who I am now. Um, but we met at that orphanage, and me and that kid Joseph, who had been at that orphanage for three years, we had beef, we had a lot of beef, because <laughs> he rode a bicycle that was uh, that was like the biggest bicycle at the orphanage, and I had a thing for wheels. <laughs> I still do. I got a couple of motorcycle scars on my body to prove it, but. So um, and back in 2009, I started writing this book. Um, and I felt that in order to kind of uh, validate my memories, I had to do some research, um, which is kind of a tough thing for me because, you know, yeah, I went to college. I, I went to Northwestern out of all places. But hey, 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 don't get excited because I went to go play football at Northwestern. <laughs> so I was, I was busy chasing the girls. But um, I got kicked out. They said, you got to get out of here. Um, and uh, after, after a couple of knee surgeries and, and some medical problems, I had to get out of there. Um, but I hate, I hate to research, but I had to. So um, the kind of the first leg of my research, research was to ask my parents kind of, you know, why did you adopt me? And, and my mother looked at me like, we didn't adopt you. You adopted us. I'm like, all right. So how does that work? So she begins to tell this story. But kind of halfway in that story, she begins to talk about Joseph, and she says the words. And by the way, we had, uh, I had invited them up from DC, um, where they live in Alexandria. And uh, we're big, our family, we're big fans of, uh, of musicals. And The Wiz was playing at City Center. Um, Ashanti was Dorothy, and Orlando Malone was The Wiz. Yeah, it was, you know, ran for a couple of weeks. But so they came up, and it was a great show. Uh, we're at a coffee house, and my mother's telling me she's divulging all this information that, uh, that I had never really asked about. Because, you know, as far as I was concerned, I had a fantastic family, a fantastic mother, so life was good. But she says the words, Milton, do you know that your brother Joseph was abandoned? I'm thinking, all right, well, me and Joe, we were in the orphanage together, in the, you know, together, so we were orphans. And orphan, I think part of that definition is orphans are abandoned. So yeah, mom, yeah. Yeah, he was abandoned, just like I was. She goes, no, there was more to that. And as my father is outside, kind of people watching, just like, the way, just, just like what I love to do, my mother begins to tell me this story about what happened to Joseph, or Joseph E. She says that when Joseph was five, living out in the countryside, just like I did with my mother, clay hut, thatch roof, no cars, no electricity, rice fields as far as the eyes can see, that him living with his mother, being black and Korean and having a Korean mother, you know, part of my story and part of our story is about the racism of Korea that we experience. You know, so, but for me, I was good with the racism because I always had my mother to come home to and had the safety of my mother's arms and my mother's words and my mother's love. 
But Joseph, the safety of his mother disappeared because she ended up marrying a Korean man that abused him. And I remember after we were adopted, being that you know, we're the only two people in the household of you know, two uh, black, you know, a, a black couple from Texas and with four natural kids. By the way, their name is Don, Donna, Darren, and Dwin. Yeah, that's, that's how black folks do. <laughs> I got a feeling some of y'all Korean folks do that too, but I don't know that for a fact. That's gonna be the next book. I'm gonna search. I'm gonna do. Uh, I got a chapter called Church and Chicken, and this is that black folks and Koreans are a lot more alike than different. I'm gonna prove that point. Y'all love some church, and we do too. But, but he was abused by this man that ended up marrying his mother. And I remember after we were adopted, he used to tell me this. And he used to say that he used to run away at the age of five. Like, how do you run away at five? But you know, like his, his village had like two roads, one going that way, one going this way. And this man would always find him. And when he did, you know, he would, he would abuse him. Until his mother got in the way and, and the abuse stopped, or at least that kind of abuse stopped. And I remember Joe telling me that this man would make him stand on his head for hours at a time. You know, I'm not a doctor, but I'm like, you know, standing on your head at the age of five for hours at a time, that can't be good for you. So I remember him telling me that. And then, at, you know, back in the coffee shop, as my mother told me that, you know, of this situation, you know, yeah, it rang true to me. Yeah, I got it. But she goes on to tell me how a family from Young Son, where my parents were stationed, they had wanted to adopt a Korean boy, a mixed Korean boy, an Amerasian. And Father King had hooked it up in which Joseph was adopted by this family. He gets adopted by this family, lives with the family for several months, and the family is now getting ready to go back overseas, and they're living in temporary housing, and one night they go to sleep, and you know, right before the day they're getting ready to leave, Joseph wakes up, he wakes up to an empty house. The family had left the boy, and they said they left the boy because he had too many emotional issues. So Father King swings back in, takes Joseph back to his mother. But now Joseph goes back to you know, the abusive situation that he was in before. And his mother sends a, a letter to Joseph's biological father because Joseph is five years old. The Korean man is not having it. And something, I think, happened in the story that's that doesn't happen in, in my stories very much, or our stories very much. That letter gets routed through the army, and, in, and it lands in the hands of Joseph's biological father, who just so happens to be serving another tour in South Korea at the time. And we're going to call him Sergeant Lewis for the sake of the story. Sergeant Lewis gets a letter saying, hey, you got to come and get your son. And then Sergeant Lewis agrees to do something that doesn't happen in, in, in my stories with Amerasian kids. It doesn't happen. He agrees to do so. Oh, and by the way, and I remember right after my mother told me that, my father comes in and says, Gwen, what are you doing telling Milton that story? And my mother's like, Don, that was the Seagrasses that adopted Joseph, and, and we can tell that story. He said, no, Milton is writing a book. You can't tell that story because we weren't there, and we can't validate that story. Yeah, because yeah, I'm going to tell the story. I'm telling it right now. <laughs> Damn right. So, but he sits down and says, we can tell you this story. We can't tell you that one. We can tell you this one. So that story is that letter being routed to his father, father finding out, coming to get his father from his mother, picking him up. 
And I remember after being adopted, Joe never told me that he lived with his father, ever. Because I, t I told him, I never knew my father. I just dreamed of him being in America, some crazy land with cities of gold that floated in the clouds and flying cars and gold streets and, and mountains made out of ice cream. That's what I thought America was. So Joseph's father, Sergeant Lewis, picks Joe up, takes him and lives in, and has his son living in, his, living in an apartment with him off the military base. Joseph's learning Korean. Sergeant Lewis is falling in love with his son. And he decides, you know, I'm going to take my son back, ho back home overseas. My tour is about to end. But the State Department says, before you take him back overseas, you have to adopt your son. OK, starts the adoption process. But one of the things about adoption process and, and kids like us, you know, being born black in Korea, we don't have any papers. We don't have birth certificates. We don't have papers. So I was, I was never a Korean citizen, even though I was my first language, my first culture, everything. So they try to do everything. They try to change his name. They try to change, try to change everything. They made him a new dude. Didn't work. So long story short, that adoption process lasts an entire year. Long time. So then, the end of Sergeant Lewis's tour, he says, you know something, I'm gonna take Joseph back, but the State Department gives him special permission to take him back overseas. So he gets his son with a pending adoption and takes him to Kimpo International Airport, take him back home. As the, the plane is boarding, Sergeant Lewis says, Joseph B, hang on just a second, I'll be right back. I'm gonna go use the restroom. Goes use the restroom, never comes back. Joseph runs to the bathroom looking for his father. And what his father had done was snuck on the plane and got on that flight to America and never came back. So then Father King, of course, has to come back to Kempo International Airport, pick him up. And that's when Joseph starts his three-year stint at Father King's house. Two years into Father King's house, is when Joseph sees a van full of American women pile out. And one of those women were, was a black woman. Big afro. You know how they do in the 70s. It's like 70, <laughs> like 75. But that black woman was Gwen Washington. She was the wife of Captain Donnell Washington. She was the only black person in that officer's wives club because her husband was Captain Donnell Washington, one of the few black officers in Asia in the 70s for the Army. And part of what the Officers Wives Club, they do is they go around and they do volunteer missions all throughout Korea. And while Gwen is at Father King's house, she's feeling some kind of way about all these little black kids and mixed white kids. And, and she comes home one day after working with the kids and says, Don, they're probably laying in bed. That's what, that's what a real conversation's happening. So Don, what do you think about adopting one of these kids? And Don Washington's like, Gwen, we got four kids. And I'm a captain. I'm down here on the totem pole, you know? So we're good. But you know, we all know who holds the real power in our family. So after a while, you know, yeah, he kind of gives in. And she says, I want that kid right there, Joseph, the saddest one in the place. So they begin the adoption process on Joseph. One week later, two weeks later, five weeks later, three months later, still doesn't go through. And they do everything to change that little boy's name and nationality and all kind of other things. It still doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because he's being adopted by somebody else. His father, who never completed the adoption before, left him at Kempo. So they do everything for an entire year. And then, at the end of Joseph's third year, Father King 
gives Don Washington, Captain Don Washington, a call while he's sitting in his office. And Father King, if you guys don't know, he spent most of his time on Capitol Hill fighting for the rights of Amerasians, saying that we should have priority access back to the states because these are our kids. That's what he did. He died just a few years ago, and God bless him. And Father King was slick. He knew every trick in the book. So he calls Don Washington, hey, Don, how you doing? They shoot the shit, blah, 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 whatever, whatever. Yeah, Don, I understand that you got two new sergeants starting um, reporting to you next Monday. Don Washington goes, yeah, yeah, Sergeant Johnson, Sergeant Lewis. That Sergeant Lewis is our Sergeant Lewis. Don Washington's like, really? Ain't this a man? Okay, click, fast forward to next Monday. So now Don Washington is briefing the two sergeants, brand new sergeants that's reporting to him on the new job. And after the, after the briefing, yeah, Sergeant Johnson, can you excuse Sergeant Lewis and I? We need to talk. So, Sergeant Lewis, it's come to my attention that several years ago you fathered a child here in South Korea. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. It's also come to my attention that several years ago, about three years ago, um, you abandoned that child at Kimpo International Airport. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Well, why'd you do it? Sir, my son was living with his mother in an abusive situation at home, Korean man that was beating him up. She asked me to come and pick him up, and I did so. Props to you. And then I fell in love with my son, and I wanted to take him home. Took him to the airport, getting ready to get on the plane. And at the last minute, I got cold feet. Because my three kids at home and my wife knew nothing about them. And I felt that as strained as my relationship was already with my wife, I felt that I was going to lose everybody. So I decided against taking Joseph. Hey, you know, my, my Don Washington, he's been around. He's like, hey, fair enough. No judgment. Sign this document. That document right there makes your adoption null and void. It finishes it like it never happened. Sign. Here, also sign this document. That document relinquishes your rights to your son, Joseph, because we're going to adopt him. Sign. Two weeks later, adoption goes through. Two weeks after that, they go out to St. Vincent's to pick Joseph up. That's where I come in. <laughs> because a week and a half before that, my mother dropped me off at the orphanage. But like I said, my mother had dropped me off at orphanages before. Between the ages of six and eight, she had dropped me off at three other orphanages. And she had dropped me off at three other orphanages because when we first moved to Bupyeong, I saw her getting arrested by the Korean police. I didn't know at the time, but she was detained by the US Army, put in what they call monkey houses. Because if you were suspected of having any STD, and you were a prostitute, you were put in monkey houses and forced therapies for those STDs, quarantined. So I, rem I just remember crying my eyes out, watching my mother getting taken away, and having the next two weeks of my life by myself at the age of six. Fortunately for me, I had found these little homeless kids and I was running around, I was doing a whole lot of this. So I was kind of good. But and kind of looking back, I know that she probably took me to these orphanages for two or three weeks at a time, but she always came and picked me up because she was probably kind of doing her time. So I'm walking around the orphanage, a bunch of Korean kids, and they're calling me gumdingy. And I'm like, well, shit, y'all the orphans. <laughs> I got a mama. 
get yours. <laughs> and sure enough, she would come to pick me up. Until that day, she dropped me off at Father King's house. And I've never been at an orphanage with a bunch of admiration kids. And like I said, I ran into Joseph. So then I ran into Joseph, and we have this beef because he has that bicycle. But I had never been to school. And that next day, because Joseph was too big, he was eight, I mean, he was 10, I was eight. I had never been to school, and he went to school the next day. And I got on that bicycle and never got off. So on that next Saturday, when I was riding that bicycle like this, I see this thing pull up in, the, in, our parking, in our parking lot that was like a spaceship to us. It was a Ford LTD. It was a 78 Ford LTD. It looked like a spaceship. I was like, what the hell is that? And then I see this black man get out. I was like, that's the blackest dude I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. And then I seen a woman pop out of the passenger side. She had this afro, she had this little thing tied around her, this little skirt. I was eight, but I knew she was fine. <laughs> I said, I want them to be my parents. So when Father King came out and shook the hands of the, the couple, and I saw them talking, and I'm riding around on the bicycle, and I'm like, yo, what's this? And then I hear them say, Joseph and the little quiet kid over in the corner, I'm like, oh, that's that dude. He's a scrub. And then the little kid walks over, and I see the woman reach down and give him a hug. I'm like, this bike is not interesting anymore. <laughs> and then Joseph goes back in the house and comes out with his bag. I'm like, I don't like this bike at all. <laughs> and as they're walking back to the car, and Father King is waving goodbye, I run to the little boy. I run to the man that has the little boy, and I grab him around his leg and say, Opa! Opa! <laughs> and Don Washington is like, yo, get this little dude off of me. I don't know him. I've never seen him in my life. And there's no telling what was going on between him and Gwen, you know what I mean? And as soon as Father King pries me off of him, I play D1 football. I put a couple of moves on Father King. Then I jumped in a Ford LTD and locked all the doors. <laughs> and as Don put the keys in one, I said, no, you're not getting in here. He runs around and you're not getting in here. <laughs> and so that's how the Washingtons became my parents. <laughs> and Joseph became my brother. Thank you.